All right, okay, here we go. Um, thank you so much for joining us today for Next Economy Conversations. And if you're Hi, meeting girl. us uh, for the first time today, um, welcome. The Center for Social Innovation is a community for entrepreneurs, organizations, and companies that are changing the world by putting people and planet first. At CSI, we connect our members to the resources that they need to accelerate their success and amplify their impact, including online events and networking opportunities, education programs, and acceleration programs. The Center for Social Innovation Institute, our affiliate charity and event partner, helps Canadians use social innovation to get to the root causes of systems level problems. In this event series, you'll hear from incredible leaders who are helping to make the recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic, one that creates positive change and that builds the next economy, one that is regenerative, equitable, and prosperous for all. And not just prosperous in terms of material prosperity and financial wealth, but especially in terms of belonging, community, health, happiness, and access. At its core, the word next really serves as an invitation to imagine, to co-create, to shape, and to participate. CSI believes that the next economy is sustainable, people-centered, circular, just, participatory, and equitable. It is conscious and caring, and it builds community wealth, health, and well-being. And the exciting thing is that the next economy is already emerging with inspiring examples here and around the world showing us what it can look like in action. And this event series is our chance to hear from those who are helping to build and shape this next economy. At CSI, we always start our events with an acknowledgement of the land, even when we're hosting virtual events. And so today we want to acknowledge that for those of us who are in Toronto, we're gathering on the, the traditional territory of the Huron-Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, the Seneca, and the Mississauga of the Credit First Nations. As we think and talk about social innovation, we are sometimes discussing a shared vision for a sustainable and just future. However, it's critical that we also reflect on the past and the present to consider how we can strive towards more inclusive, resilient communities that incorporate and respect many different ways of knowing and being. And as we have moved our work and our lives into the digital realm over the last year, this also means considering how patterns of inequality can transcend into these spaces. So on that note, we want to share this quote from Alexander Dirksen on decolonizing digital spaces. Meaningful change begins with recognition of technological innovation as a fundamentally human endeavor. Behind the sleek glass and metal enclosures of our lithium charged lifelines are people with each line of code carrying with it all the complexities of human existence. Technology is not a neutral force, nor are digital spaces safe spaces for all, instead mirroring, replicating, and at times exacerbating the real and pressing realities faced by Indigenous peoples and other marginalized communities in physical spaces. A social justice lens must therefore be applied to all that we discuss, design, and develop in the digital realm. So we encourage you to consider what it might look like in your work to apply a social justice lens, whether you're also hosting emergent conversations or if you're participating in them and shaping them. And we also invite you to check out this resource called Native Land to learn more about the land that you're on. And without further ado, I'm delighted to introduce our guest for this month, Peter Dietz. Peter is a serial entrepreneur committed to creating enduring companies that have a deeply rooted social and environmental purpose. Peter co-founded Grantbook in 2012 and currently serves as board chair. Grantbook is a 25 person philanthropic advisory firm that helps foundations operationalize mission and vision by leveraging technology. Over the past two years, Peter championed and helped oversee the formation of Grantbook's employee share ownership plan, which we'll hear a lot about today. Peter currently serves as full-time co-founder of Unwrap It, a social purpose business that helps companies spark and maintain meaningful connections through a fun, innovative, and easy to use virtual gifting platform. Both Grantbook and Unwrap It were born out of the Center for Social Innovations Annex location. Peter will be in conversation today with our CEO at the Center for Social Innovation, Tanya Sermon. Tanya is fueled by her belief in the power of collaboration and belonging. She knows that putting the right people in a room is only the first step in creating real change. 
you also need to build a, a culture where everyone knows that they have value and a voice to radically redesign our futures. She did this with the Center for Social Innovation, which reinvented the workplace by collecting social purpose organizations under one roof. And it's what she's doing with CSI's affiliate charity, the Center for Social Innovation Institute and Social Innovation Canada, unlocking the social innovation community to get at the root causes of problems. She knows that building relationships between people is the foundation for a better world. And it's also a heck of a lot of fun. Tanya, I'm going to hand it over to you to get the conversation started. Thank you so much, Zoya. And thank you for that beautiful introduction. Um, you are uh, the epitome of grace. And I, um, I challenged uh, Zoya to do the definition of the next economy because I stumble on it so often myself, um, but you did beautiful. Uh, it was perfect. So thank you so much. And, and Peter, welcome. I'm so delighted to have you here today. It's, um, oh, it's been a long journey, my friend. <laughs> and, uh, I, we were just reflecting and I just want to I want to welcome you to Next Economy Conversations, Peter. Your work from the day that I met you uh, has inspired me. You are truly a serial social entrepreneur. And uh, I just want to take a couple minutes to kind of reflect on, on, on where we have come together and what, what has brought you uh, to this moment. So just to let everybody know, I, I met you, Peter. God, it has to be back before 2007, because you did a presentation um, uh, in suite 120 of CSI back before we had an upstairs. So it had to be between 2004 and 2007. And you were, you were pitching. I, well, you tell me, tell me what you were doing and welcome. Welcome. Thank Peter. you. Thank yeah. you, Tanya. It's a, a pleasure to be here and to be having this conversation. I wish it was in per person, uh, but it is what it is. Um, I have no idea what I was pitching in that moment, uh, but it was something to do with social actions, which was the precursor to grant book unrelated, of course, uh, and just one of several social purpose businesses I've found myself uh, uh, starting up over the years. So tell us a little bit about that history, Peter, and you know, give us a sense of your, your trajectory, what you've been doing uh, to get to this moment. Absolutely, happily. So um, I, I am at, thrilled to be here. First of all, I think ESOPs have, have become a, a side passion of mine. And so it's really a privilege to take an hour to talk about them or however much time we have. Um, and by way of introduction, what I'd like to say is that the same journey that brought me to doing social purpose businesses is the journey that brought me to employee ownership as a, a continuity and exit strategy. Um, that makes sense. Um, so when I was thinking about the journey that led me to start social purposes businesses like Grand Book or Unwrap It, um, it's really about the core influences on my life. Um, and I, I would say CSI itself at this point is a core influence. If, if I was in your midst and in the physical spaces of CSI 15 years ago, and I'm 42 now, that's, that's a good portion of my life that's been shaped by this incredible community. Mm -hmm. um, I also had significant Quaker influences on my life growing up. That's where I think the social justice and nonviolence uh, commitment comes. Uh, judo, a uh, defensive martial art uh, that taught me how to be strong without absent aggression. Mm -hmm. um, and I think most importantly, as it relates to the topic of ESOPs, I come from a politically polarized family, a loving family, uh, but politically polarized. So my father, is a conservative, my mother is a uh, liberal, a progressive, and this taught me and built my capacity to understand multiple perspectives as truth mm -hmm. and to sort of yearn for creative solutions that are the right answer to multiple questions. Anyone who's dug into ESOPs in their past knows that broadly speaking, employee ownership has significant support from both conservative and progressive. Mm -hmm. uh, parties. Wow. Um, I, I just, the, the Quaker reference and the polarization, I, I we could do entire conversations exactly. on that. I, and, uh, you know, I, I have to say, I'm often struck. Thank you. Thank you for calling out that. And, you know, there's a book called Getting to Maybe 
uh, ran, uh, written by Brenda Zimmerman, Francis Wesley, and Michael Quinn Patton. And it's a beautiful book that really did so much to launch social innovation. But what was interesting was all of the people that they spoke about had a spiritual practice. Mm -hmm. And, um, but, but really, they didn't really profile that. And my, I do want to sort of um, acknowledge that so much of this work does come out of our, um, how we were raised and what our spiritual beliefs are and um, those values coming into the world. I just, yeah, that's, it's beautiful. I, I want to go there another time, but so tell me, so you came to CSI with social action in t let's say 2006. What's your path been, Peter? Since, since then, okay, so more concretely. More concretely, uh, I, I want to go into the too, Got but it. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> more concretely. Um, Sports, spirituality and how it relates to social change. Awesome. Yeah, I had to get that in. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I love it. My, my more sort of resume path uh, towards this work is I, I did launch Social Actions, which was a, a, a API before APIs were a thing, uh, taking on Google AdWords. So the vision, you know, to attract a lot of interest and, and support, uh, if, if, if uh, at the same time I was never able to really make it work, uh, was that um, you know, whenever you go to a website, there should have there should be calls to action, calls to do good in the world, and not advertisements. So we were building a platform to facilitate those calls to action, whether you know participating in crowdfunding campaigns, signing petitions, going to events, and to get all those actions aggregated, we needed to have relationships with many sources of, of social action. Mm -hmm. uh, so so yeah, social actions was was that it was an open data set and API that third party developers could tap into and present these calls to action in their own websites, apps, and, and, and products. Mm -hmm. um, it taught me that you need to have a good understanding of cash flow and value proposition <laughs> and um, monetization because I, I actively resisted all three and, and social actions you know, is not with us today. <laughs> uh, from there, I spent a year at Mars uh, in the um, being, serving as the managing editor of socialfinance.ca. Mm -hmm. Mars was an incredible support to me in a year where I needed to pay off um, some credit card debt that I should never have had. Uh, and to, to take the time to contemplate what my next entrepreneurial move would be. Uh, coming out of that year at Mars, um, I launched Grand Book uh, with Anil Patel, who are the co-founders. And um, we set out to create a consultancy that would um, help foundations with their own digital transformation. This was 10 years ago. So mm -hmm. we were early to the, to the, to the uh, conversation. And foundations at that time were really looking for help moving largely from paper-based systems to digital, if you can imagine. Today, it's you know, Grant Book helps foundations move from digital systems that aren't working to new digital systems that are working. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the time, many of our clients were, were looking for just how do we get, how do we digitize? Um, and Grant Book uh, is now 25 person organization, as I mentioned in her introduction, it has an even broader understanding of, of its impact and, and the reason people uh, come come to Grant Book for, for support, what the reason foundations come to Grant Book for support. Um, but I think what has made it a success and why it's thriving at 10 years in uh, is that its value proposition has held throughout. So it's always been about being sector specific, knowing philanthropy inside and out, knowing those roles and requirements, and to uh, being technology agnostic. So we've never, Grant Book has never hitched its uh, business to any one software solution or ecosystem. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore, we can serve as that trusted partner uh, to foundations. Grant Book has been a B Corps since 2013. We were also early to the B Corps um world i think first 1000 in the world um hmm. now there's over 3000 um and um our esop again which we'll get to in a moment uh is going to result in a significant increase in our b impact assessment score uh when uh we're reassessed this year so i'm really looking forward to that we were really lucky to have uh, uh, Kasha Huck from B Corp uh, on uh, Next Economy Conversations uh, a few months back and, um, you know, quite an amazing uh, um, process for really helping guide organizations, uh, companies through that process towards more values-based. 
So, yeah. you know, we're we're super we're super pleased. We're super proud of you guys up at Grant Book. We are as CSI, um, you know, watch have watched over the last ten years as as the team grew from a you know an idea through to like a hot desk and a desk and then a team table and then a and then a room and then and then a, a whole office and um, and the and then and then ultimately graduated out of our space uh, at some point we. You guys all get too big for us, <laughs> and, and we consider that a massively successful endeavor. Um, and watching the team grow and focus, I, it looks like you got past your your depth of knowledge around cash flow management. And uh, <laughs> and you know, I have to tell you, one day we should do a, a whole next economy just on our failures uh, as business uh, people. Because um, yeah, I remember where I learned uh, cash flow management was a little company I started called Walk Your Talk Publications, which I realized the more I marketed, the more in debt I would become. So at, at age 23, I learned it hard, hard lesson. So, but then you went and uh, started Unwrap It. So before we get into um, uh, the ESOP, just what, what is Unwrap It and, and what are you doing there? Happily. Um, so correct. The, the story doesn't end at Grant Book. My involvement today is um, really governance. So I'm, I'm, I'm involved in as a board chair um, and support where needed. Uh, it's a, a grant book, you know, as an organization has proven incredibly resilient, especially through these times. Um, and reliance on the board and particularly me is, is minimal, uh, for which I'm incredibly grateful um, and, and fortunate. That's given me the space uh, to, to do something new that's entrepreneurial. Um, and for me, over the last several years, that's been uh, standing up Unwrap It, uh, which today is a, a product that just launched. We have our um, first significant gift campaign coming up in a week uh, mm -hmm. for a major association in Canada. Uh, 2,000 gifts are going out, uh, valued at about 100 uh, I shouldn't say <laughs> how much, but it's it's an exciting opportunity. And what Unwrap It ultimately is doing is introducing corporate um, gifting and event gifting that, that, that eliminates landfill. So all of the gifts that could be delivered through Unwrap It, virtually opened, personalized, um, and, and um, are not destined for landfill. They're always experiential, practical, charitable, or um, digital. Mm -hmm. And those are the kinds of corporate gifts that we think people want uh, to be receiving at this point in time, especially from companies or events, mm -hmm. and rather than water bottles and mouse pads and, and um, hats and t-shirts. Uh, so we're really trying to disrupt event gifting and corporate gifting by introducing a digital alternative that people want. Beautiful. Peter, you are uh, the quintessential social entrepreneur, and I see that you've always used technology in, it's always been sort of the under, um, you know, the platform piece that how do you use social tech uh, to make change and, and, um, and I guess, you know, judo, Quakerism, polarization, what keeps your energy going to do this work? What's the stuff that keeps you going? I noticed that you had another baby somewhere in the intro. Like, did you have a second child? I do. <laughs> we, have, we have Florence, who's now with us and seven months old. Uh, ah, she's adorable. Um, and uh, Jack during COVID, these things happen. These, these children have been manifested. I know. You, you don't I have know. a clue, you know? <laughs> we have friends who've been pregnant and given birth and we've not, we've not seen them, didn't know. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, no, how do I possibly find the, the energy? So I, one of the th questions was, how am I doing now? And I wrote I, my prep, I thought I'm, I'm emotionally exhausted because of the pandemic, craving the companies for other, and due to the nature of what I have taken on entrepreneurially, I'm overworked from home. Uh, so <laughs> I don't really, I can't tell you, I have no secret sauce for how to keep going. Um, I probably have too much on my plate right now, if I'm being honest. Um, but I do have I do have that strength and that sort of um, resilience, and, um, endurance um, that I, I think can be cultivated. I think mm -hmm. I had to cultivate it uh, at some point in my life. I don't think it's innate. Mm -hmm. You're speaking truth, my friend. Uh, today being the day that we have our, our collective stay-at-home order, 
uh, in, a, in a pandemic that just doesn't seem to want to end uh, finding the strength. And, but maybe, maybe as we jump, I'm going to jump right into the employee shared ownership plan. Maybe these new ideas, this time for reflection, this, you know, this pandemic will give us the opportunity to, I think many of us talk about the, the opportunity to reflect on what really matters as a culture and as a society and to look at um, how we're shifting what success is in our lives individually and collectively. And when I um, heard that you were doing uh, an employee shared ownership plan, I was really excited to speak to you because of course we, we, we heard about the um, ESOPs from Bill Young, who is the opening speaker of our next economy conversations. And he was very excited about what this might mean. And certainly as we're facing so many challenges in our society around racism and, 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 and you know, systemic issues that we've been trying to address, they all come back to this economic system, cultural systems too, but this economic system, this question of how do we redistribute wealth? What does succession look like? Uh, what is money? How much do we need? You know, the profit model as an entrepreneur, you know, entrepreneurs are known for the, the for, you know, getting in, working really hard, being a part of that creative process and then selling, you know, um, but in some of these next economy models, it's not quite as simple as that, or there's other options. And so let's just talk, let's just get right in there. So you're transitioning to an ESOP. So first of all, what is an ESOP and why did you decide this was the right model for you guys? So some of, some of the next uh, 20 minutes will be very technical and hopefully will yeah. deliver value to those who are in the weeds of, of choosing this path or implementing this path. And some of it will be very introductory. Um, uh, so I actually think ESOP is a bit of a, a bad uh, four-letter word, um, and it's a bad four-letter word because it can mean so many different things, and it creates a lot of confusion. Um, mm -hmm. And so in the context of, an, of grant book, and e e ESOP means employee share ownership plan, which means employees have an opportunity to buy into an ownership stake in the business. Um, uh, John Shell of also Social Capital Partners pointed out to me last week that, or this week, that really grant books, what grant book has should be called a, a share purchase plan, uh, an SPP. Um, and, and instead, it, we refer to it as an ESOP. In many tech startups, employees are given options, and that's called an ESOP because it's an employee share options plan. And options presumes the big exit to a third party. Um, where, uh, you know, just before a sale is made, employees who have options can buy at a lower price. And then, nice puppy there. I've got mine over here, it's fortunately passed out. He was scratching on the door, my apologies. <laughs> not a problem, not a problem. Um, and so, yeah, when we're talking about options in a startup context, it's not going to solve the systemic problems you've talked about around the concentration of wealth or um, capital. Um, and then there's ESOPs in the more um, um, pure impact uh, perspective, where employees who work at a business, you know, uh, effectively are allotted shares the longer they work, you know, or the more senior they are, whatever it is, they are essentially um, granted shares, although that might not be the technically correct word because it has tax implications, um, but on exiting the company as an employee, whatever the company is worth at that time, those employees who built up that ownership stake are paid out. Um, and, and in some cases, those shares that they've earned into or been given uh, can sit in a retirement plan like uh, and therefore be paid out over time and reduce the tax burden. That is, uh, that's like the ESOP trust model that SCP, Social Capital Partners is championing. And it, um, when done right with the correct policy supports can actually um, achieve a greater scale than any of the other forms of ESOP that we'll talk about today. Because um, companies are incentivized to introduce, introduce those processes. Um, and for example, they could be you know, given a break on taxes or if they're, if they're truly you know, moving towards full employee ownership um, where the employees don't have to pay a lower Brian is asking you to speak a little louder, Peter. Oh, we have sorry. a volume. A volume problem. 
that uh, that I can work on. I can enunciate. If I had my standing desk with me, I'd be standing because I know I talk louder when I stand. Um, but uh, yes, I will try to talk louder. Thank you. Much better. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, basically, there's no simple answer to what an ESOP is. We could talk about what it is at Grantbook because uh, that's what I know most about. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to point out that it does. It it is. It can be many different things. Great. And I, I see that. And I think one of the things that um, will be an important question, we might as well get it up, but uh, figured out up front is the difference between, and so you're a for-profit and um, there's the other side of things, which would be like a, a worker co-op. Um, so I guess just to kind of clarify the difference at that level between an, uh, what an ESOP is and a worker co-op. Mm -hmm. And if I get out of my league on what on any of this or out of my depths, because I'm remember I'm a practitioner, not a theorist. Well, um, Brian will please, correct us in the chat. Yes, yeah, someone will correct <laughs> us. Um, so a worker cooperative, from my understanding, is a, a sep entirely separate, a legal entity that is not either a for-profit corporation with private shareholders or a nonprofit that has no shares and, and just a board of directors. And um, and in the con in a worker cooperative workers are uh, governing the, the organization at every level, making all the relevant decisions that affect them. They might choose to have formal management or they can be, become the management. Um, and you can buy into a worker cooperative. A worker a cooperative can be a B Corp. Nonprofit cannot, from what I understand. Mm -hmm. um, if, if anyone is interested in learning more about the intersection of B Corp and worker cooperatives. There's a great organization out of um, Portland, Oregon called Pixel Spoke, and they've made the transition or are making the transition to fully worker owned cooperative and B Corp. Grant nice. Book has not gone that route for very practical reasons, uh, which I'm happy to get into. Okay, good. Well, that's that's helpful. So let's let's just go to the why. Why um why did you decide that an ESOP or a shared purchase plan, if you will, um, was right for grant book? Like what were the conditions that you were, um, what were you trying to achieve? Sure, I, and I, ESOP at this point sounds much better uh, to me than a shared purchase plan. It sounds so technical and boring. <laughs> Thanks, John. Uh, but uh, well, let's, for today, I'll continue to call it a ESOP so we're not confusing or adding additional confusion. Um, why did we, why is Grand Book on in this route? Why have I as a um, con person who controlled the founder shares uh, decided to, to do this? I decided to do this because it was the right thing to do um, just at the most basic level, right? I, you know, employees create the value, especially in a professional services firm. They have, in my view, every right uh, to be in the ownership mix and to own uh, a portion of the business. So ethically and morally, I, I was on board um, even, and that's why I started looking into it. Then I found out it's the right answer to multiple questions. Like how do you achieve greater retention in your organization? How do you um, create um, uh, greater growth and, and margins? ESOP employee owned companies generally perform better in the traditional financial rubrics. Um, there's um, also, uh, of course, benefits um, in terms of the decisions the company makes. Um, they can take into account the multiple perspectives of different stakeholders, much like a B Corps would. Um, so for me, I also started to pursue it because it was the right answer to multiple questions, including questions I had myself, like how do I exit and preserve the culture? How do I exit and get uh, achieve some liquidity from this investment and from these shares I own, um, but do it in a way that's going to going to create the most positive uh, uh, for grant book as well and for the employees. Okay, this is now I'm I'm really into it now. So I love it. So let's just describe what the structure of the ESOP for grant book is. So what will happen and how does it work? Yeah. So for for grant book itself. Um, employees own outright shares that that they've either earned into or purchased. And okay. the difference is that a certain number of employees who were long-term or saw grant book through especially difficult periods uh, were earned in effectively to a portion of 
the shares set aside for employee ownership. Um, everyone else, including those employees, have had an opportunity on an annual basis to buy into additional shares at fair market value as an independent third party um, determines it to be. Each year, employees receive dividends on those shares they own. That's a unique quality to the form of ESOP that we have. Uh, an ESOP trust would not pay out dividends to employee owners until they leave the company, is my understanding. Um, right now, Grand Book's at 21 and change percent ownership, and we have a pathway to at least 30% ownership over the coming years. It could be more than that. Um, these are voting common shares, uh, so they're not proxy shares, and they are not uh, non-voting shares. So these, if there's ever a shareholder decision that goes to shareholders, anyone who's an employee owner will, can vote using their common shares. Um, anyone who works at Grand Book for more than a year is eligible uh, to participate in the ESOP, um, and everyone can participate um, equally. There is no differentiation of like seniority can buy into larger portions or, you know, someone who is newer to the business or earlier in their career uh, has to buy into a smaller port. Everyone can buy in equally each year. Um, uh, ESOP group uh, can uh, uh, nominate a director to, gov to the governing board of Grant Book. And that was actually just triggered uh, when the ESOP group uh, surpassed 20% ownership. So we're in the process right now of figuring out how and um, who, uh, you know, and ultimately it will be the employee group that determines who will be their nominated director to sit on and participate in the board as a full, full director. Um, I forgot what question I was answering. I'm running through all of the, uh, the features we had to make and the features. Yeah. Yes. So let me let me ask you a couple of clarifying questions then just mm -hmm. to keep us on thing. So, mm -hmm. so I, the idea here is that um, you've now you've got a, a mission to uh, distribute a total of thirty percent of the shares to employees over a period of time. Correct. Correct. And who owns the other seventy? Right. So this speaks to why we're not a worker cooperative. Um, at the time we were introducing the, the ESOP, we were also um, hiring for a managing director. Yeah. And so the managing director simultaneously is earning into a 20% stake in the business. Right. Um, and, and so that gets, that's like 50. Uh, um, we formed a board at the same time that we were forming this ESOP. So each board member has earned into a 1% ownership stake. Mm -hmm. um, and then, and then a hold co owns the balance of the shares. So I actually am no longer a shareholder and have not been since October, uh, 2018. Why? Sorry, that's confusing to me. <laughs> and do you, uh, do you own the hold co? So and this gets technical, uh, but I do not own the Hold Co. My wife, uh, Samantha, owns the Hold Co. She is the sole shareholder of the Hold Co. And I had to transfer the shares to her um, because I'm also a U.S. citizen. And at the time, there was um, some, some uh, legislation coming out of the U.S. that would uh, pr profoundly penalize me personally, but also Grant Book for having more than 50% um, ownership of a Canadian company held by an American. So it's okay. purely for technical reasons, but that's the structure we landed on. So effectively though, what you've got is you, um, you effectively hold on to 50% through the whole co of the, um, of the corporation. And then you are, have a plan where the person who is now leading the managing director role would have would be working towards a 20% ownership. And then the 30% would be ultimately allocated to the employees over a period of time. Do I have it right? Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. Okay. And, and each, everybody, mm -hmm. but each year the hold co makes available a certain number of its shares in grant book for purchase by the employee group. Nice. And are there um so, you know, somebody with 
more seniority who's been there for longer would hypothetically have more shares or a larger percentage, correct? If they chose to participate. So if they not chose. all employees need to or are obligated to participate. What percentage of your staff have chosen to participate? Of the eligible staff, those who've worked more than one year, um, all but two are our employee owners. So they've, and I believe at this point, 100% of the employees who are eligible and who received earned in shares have also purchased nice. shares. So there's, there's a, been a significant uptake um, on, this, on this offer. So, and um, everyone who has a share has, um, a, 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 is able to bring any issues of governance through the person that they've appointed. So there would be potentially one person from that 30% or as a group who then would have a voice at the governance board. That's what's, what you're moving towards. That's what we're in the process. Yes, yeah, so our next board meeting is in early May. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we hope to have uh, an ESOP nominated director mm -hmm. uh, either appointed by that point um, or the, the process underway to appoint. And it could be an employee owner or the employee group could choose to have an independent you know, director represent them at the, at the board level. That is their decision. And they have as much vote as they do percentage or how does the, the correlation between, I mean, the thing about a, a co-op is that it is one member, one vote. It's not correlated to share. I'm assuming this is correlated to the percentage of share or no? For decisions that go to shareholders, then yes, uh, the number of common shares you hold will determine the votes. Not very many decisions go to shareholders. Nice. Um, for decisions that go to the board, um, I guess one of uh, one seventh, because there will be seven, but soon then eight directors right. uh, would be represented through that. But keep in mind that all the shareholders of Grant Book, all of the directors, and all of the employees have made a commitment through B Corp to take into the perspective the interests of multiple stakeholders, including the planet. So yeah. it, we're not anticipating, um, I'm not anticipating anyway, um, necessarily dis divisive um, uh, de um, deliberation around core decisions. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's about aligning these groups who are now the owners around effective decisions that will benefit all of the stakeholders we made this commitment to. Mm -hmm. Right. So even the ESOP group, even the Holdco group, even the managing director group have, have made a public statement that they're not representing just their own interest as shareholders. Mm -hmm. That's where the fusion of B Corp and ESOP or B Corp and employee owned mm -hmm. is really powerful. So interesting. Okay. So now what has this done uh, for the staff? Right. And that's, uh, if there are any staff listening in on the chat, please, by all means, pipe in. Um, but I, I, I think over time, our B Corps status and our employee ownership feature or uh, foundation will become the bedrock cultural um, centers of gravity for Grant Book. So that these are two foundational uh, very concrete uh, uh, attributes or characteristics of grant book. And I think what they do for employees is create a psychologically safe workplace. They create a workplace that has deeply rooted values mm -hmm. um, and they, they, they create economic opportunity. It's so interesting. Um, I, I don't actually know all your staff's name, but I'm looking at the participant list to see. <laughs> <laughs> who's on there. Um, and um, so is there anything that I've missed in terms of the how it, oh, well, here's just a question. The, so when a staff leaves, uh, what happens? When a staff, when any, when any staff member, employee leaves, um, their shares in the company uh, can be bought out by any other shareholder 
in practice, what that means is any other ESOP employee owner has an opportunity to buy those shares uh, at the current valuation. And if there's no other shareholder that will buy the shares, um, then the corporation is obligated to buy them back. So an employee who is no longer an employee um, is also no longer a shareholder. And that's how we've designed our ESOP. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, Sarah Saddington says, hi, Sarah from Grant Book chiming in. I'll be eligible to buy in the next round. The B Corp ESOP was a big part of why I joined the team. Definitely some great cultural benefits to this structure. Amazing. You got, your, got your vote. There we go. <laughs> to, I should also say the grant book team is immensely busy right now. You can imagine more than a few grant makers have realized they're behind the eight ball when it comes to digital transformation and systems. So because <laughs> the pandemic. So we are we are very, very, very busy uh, business at the moment. I, I'm really I is there anything else about the model itself? Because I, I mean, I think it's brilliant. And um, but is there anything I'm, else that I'm missing in there? Um, I think, I mean, we get, we'd be getting really into the weeds uh, with any of the other things, but obviously there were lots of decisions and paperwork and lawyers and accountants that helped us through this. Uh, put a shout out, uh, Crow Soberman was our accountant helping educate all of us on the tax implications. And uh, Kevin West of, and his team at Skylaw were the uh, lawyers helping us paper it all. Mm -hmm. And Jennifer Williams of Aesop Builders uh, is uh, was the kind of consultant who helped keep every all the trains on track and uh, get us over the finish line uh, around the alignment around what we were creating. Yeah, beautiful. And um, one of the questions that was just being asked, I think it's important now, is how was the valuation established of the company? Yes, we have an independent uh, third party value the business once a year on December 31st. Um, and that uh, we, we, we work with Welch um, Group, um, Adam Nime specifically and his team. Um, and they've, so they've done the valuation now three times, I think, December 31st, 2018, 19, they'll be doing 20. They, uh, sorry, I'm getting confused. They've done the valuation each time we've had a valuation done. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, and so another interesting attribute of our ESOP and all of the share purchases that are happening is that it's on the enterprise value of the business and not the equity value. So enterprise is the value of the operations of the business and, and not operations of the business plus cash on hand. Mm -hmm. Our cash flow is sort of very secular and we would hate to have created incentives for someone to resign or give notice at an upswing in cash uh, flow. Um, uh, just to sort of see a greater bump. It's, it, this seemed like a right thing to do, but it means that when the hold co sells shares, it's, all, it's selling shares at the enterprise value and not the equity value. Interesting. Uh, that's very interesting. So, so first of all, congratulations. Uh, and, and congratulations for coming up with what I think is, you know, one of the things I'm constantly thinking about is how do we do a... Um, how do we do successful succession planning, right? Like how do we, how do we exit uh, these initiatives in a way that retains the core integrity of what we set out to build? Um, and it sounds like it's been successful. Any, any reflections on things that were really hard in this process or things that really gave you um, excitement? And is it working to achieve the retention, the margins, that kind of yep. stuff? Tension, margins, growth, culture, continuity, um, uh, economic opportunity. Like I, my list of, of uh, benefits was, 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 was incomplete. Um, yes, I would say it is. It's early to say there's always risk um, with any business or any business trans transition, ownership transition. So I, would, I, don't, I don't think we're at mission accomplished and probably never will be, right? Um, but by all accounts, especially with this most recent round getting full uptake um, in terms of 50,000 shares were made available, 49,999 were subscribed to, I would say we're, we're in very good shape. Uh, fan, it's, uh, it, it's just so fantastic. And the, the question I have is a game changer. So for you now, your role is you've, you're not involved in day-to-day -day decision-making anymore. 
Congratulations. <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. my fantasy. Right. Uh, uh, and and but decision making works in the company in the way that it would with any company. Uh, yeah. You still have hierarchy and job descriptions and all those sorts of things. Yeah, and that might also be a um, a differentiator. A worker cooperative, as I said, can have a purely it could have a um, a purely egalitarian you know, hierarchy list uh, structure. So mm -hmm. could an employee owned company. Um, there are benefits and drawbacks to 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 to, to implementing those approaches. Mm -hmm. um, the way I've described Grant Book, um, and and keep in mind Grant Book's always evolving and changing, is that we are technically hierarchical because we have a board and we have a managing director and we have like a leadership team, um, but we that structure is there to actually keep in place a culture that really um, values autonomy and um, you know, decision-making at the lowest appropriate level, right? Mm -hmm. The people closest to the work are making the salient decisions. Um, mm -hmm. um, so th there's a couple questions in the chat that I'll just ask around, is the goal eventually to for you to not have 50%, but rather to ultimately have it become fully employee owned or, or is the, are you happy with the structure that it is now? Um, yeah, I mean, so, we're talking about, if we want to talk about downsides of an ESOP, you know, for a founder like myself, a co-founder, um, this is a very, very slow process, a gradual exit. Um, I love Grant Book. I want Grant Book only to thrive and succeed. I do not need to be, you know, holding on to shares for that to happen. Um, so yeah, the intention is to continue to, to see that percent ownership decrease over time. Um, and ideally with, you know, as much of it going to the employee group as, as the employee group is interested in purchasing. So, and this is my question. Now there's a couple other technical questions around it being a one, based on one year of value or three year average, quick and dirty. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, each, whatever the latest value is, is the buy and sell price. So it's one year. Um, and then my question is actually about who, what kinds of organizations, like you said at the very beginning that because you're a professional services organization, the ESOP model might have made more sense. And I'm, I'm actually really interested because I think so often we need to match the mission with the, with the model. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, is there a type of group or a type of company that you think it would not be well suited to? Or who do you think it's ideally suited for? I do think there's something about... Um, definitely finding ways of, of highly skilled people with deep specialization who, you know, that they are sort of all key people, right? Mm -hmm. All key person that this model might be even better suited for, but the thoughts on that? So there's a lot there in the U S there are many more uh, employee owned businesses uh, than in Canada, same for UK. And um, if you talk to social capital partners, um, they would say that, it's actually low wage businesses that have high margins that are in the best position to take full advantage of the economic benefits of an ESOP. Mm -hmm. um, so imagine, you know, working in a grocery store for 20 or 30 years, slowly earning in while not paying money for shares in that business, say Loblaws, and then you retire and you own how, that amount of stock in this publicly, you know, in this business. Um, either pri publicly held or privately, uh, and you, that's a portion of your retirement. So employee ownership, like any form of capital, uh, uh, is agnostic to who owns it. You know, like a, that was a very bad sentence. But my point is employees, no matter the business they're in, uh, if it's a private business that has shares, my position is they, there should be a pathway to own, um, ownership. Nice, nice. We have so many questions and I have one more and then we're going to share it over to uh, back to Zoya. She's going to have to synthesize. Some of them I think have been mm -hmm. answered. Um, but, you know, my question is, where do you see ESOPs fitting into the greater movement around building the next economy? Like, this is the big picture. Like, where do you see this? Uh, how important is this part to the to the big picture of where we're trying to go? Yeah, I hope I hope I get this one. I hope I articulate what I want to say um, well. So my, there, there are tr 
There's trillions of dollars in wealth that's currently held in ownership of businesses that will be transferred over the coming years because baby boomers who hold a lot of that are retiring or enlightened you know, owners of businesses who want to move on to something else um, don't have an easy button to embrace what we've been talking about. Um, mm -hmm. It was exceptionally hard work to get to where we are with Grant Books ESOP. And um, if a group can make it easy to turn any kind of company into a partially or fully owned employee company, then the impact on Canada's economy, on the global economy would be um, on, unlike any other intervention that could be made in the capital markets. Mm -hmm. So this is an, a tremendously powerful lever. As I said at the top, it generally has bipartisan support and it makes financial sense too for the lenders and investors who facilitate these ESOP conversions. There's a financial case, a strong financial case for this model. Um, so there is, there is actually no limit to the positive systemic um, effects this, what we've been talking about can have, whether with respect to uh, economic opportunity and growth, uh, you know, it, racial uh, discrimination and justice, um, building businesses that take into account more of the environmental and social effects they have, like ESOP and employee ownership can have a big impact on across all of those realms. I, I see ESOPs as a fundamental strategy for the redistribution of wealth to those who have not otherwise had it historically. It's a, a powerful tool for reconciliation and for inclusion in our economic systems. And I, I, um, I know I need to wrap up. I just want to say, Peter, it's always a pleasure to chat with you, but I really, at the deepest part of my heart, I just want to see and recognize what an incredible contribution you're making uh, to the world. Your work over the time that I have known you is extraordinary, but your, your consistent going back to those core values that you picked up and the Quakers and the judo, uh, those, are, those are the kinds of values that we need more of in this world. And I just um, thank you for being such an extraordinary, inspiring leader to take these risks and to, and to prove to the world that we really can build an economy that puts people on planet first. So thank you so much. You're, you're very kind to say all that and right back at you. Uh, you, you your impact in this world is, is and, and in our town of Toronto is, is unlike anyone, anyone else's. So thank you. And I miss the CSI community. Me too. We'll be back. Zoya, do we have any time for any questions? <laughs> Yeah, I think we can maybe get to one, maybe two. Most of them were already answered. So thanks so much for, for being uh, flexible with us, with us asking uh, questions throughout. Uh, there was a question about, um, are there different types uh, or levels of ownership? You spoke a little bit about the, uh, the, the eligibility that an employee needs to have. Can you share a bit more about that, Peter? Yeah, so the nice thing about um... ESOPs being so messy and snowflake-like is that they can be whatever you want them to be with the right accountant and lawyer. You can literally shape shift capital and shares in a business to be anything you want it to be. Um, we chose to have one year as the eligibility criteria. Um, that was just our decision. Some might say five. Some might say it's just for key personnel, whatever that means. Others might say it's just for non-management and it's for the lower wage workers in our business. Um, so and it could be right on day one of your job or it could be after five years. So there's lots of flexibility and levers to pull. Great, thank you. Uh, I know that you talked a bit about um, how you worked with some folks who are external to your company to, to get some support. You mentioned an accountant and other uh, folks who are maybe consulting. Um, people were curious if the ESOP structure that you currently have for grant book existed or how you pulled it together, how long did that take? Mm -hmm. um, so our, our, our in, in, Jennifer Williams of ESOP Builders, um, they also have a book called ESOPs in Canada, a must read for anyone contemplating this move. Um, that was where I started. She helped us create the template, the blueprint, is what she actually called it, an ESOP blueprint for our home. I think that it's actually a great metaphor because in regular construction and housing, there 
there's a lot of talk about modular and, and making it prefab and making these things come together fast. But in practice, 90% of construction is, is bespoke. And from unfortunately, because we lack uh, proper legislation around this, each ESOP conversion is going to be bespoke until otherwise um, it's otherwise the case. So long answer, ours is totally unique to us. Happy to share with anyone who's interested more you know, specifics to hopefully accelerate your journey. Um, but it ultimately is a bespoke custom home kind of situation. Great, thank you for that. And that's a great analogy. Um, we will follow up with everyone who's attended uh, to share some links to your work at Grantbook and unwrap it. Uh, Peter, is there anything else you wanted to share before we wrap up? Um, just that, you know, this, as I said at the beginning, is a, a side passion has become something I know a lot about, but don't have many forums to express it. So if anyone just wants to talk or connect about employee ownership and it's uh, it, it, how it can be applied in their work and in their situations, I'm happy to uh, connect with people on this topic. Fabulous. And we have an invitation from uh, Peter Cameron, I knew he'd be there from the Ontario Worker Co-op Association to, um, to take a look at the role of co-ops too. And maybe, maybe, maybe Peter, and I can have you join us on a next economy conversation and tell us all about the worker co-op version of this. So uh, lots of different options, but isn't it a delight that we have so many ways that we're actually moving in the same general direction. So outstanding, Peter, again, thank you, Zoya, phenomenal. You guys are awesome. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Zoya. Awesome. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you. And we'll see you next time uh, for our next Economy Conversations. And we'll follow up in the coming weeks with a recording of this conversation and some resources. See you, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you.